In this topic, we're going to look at part three of gene technology. So we're going to look at what the importance of sticky ends is, inserting a gene into a vector, transformation which involves inserting a vector into a host, then identifying the bacterial cells, which are your hosts, that have taken up the recombinant DNA, and then growth of these bacterial cells. Now in the last two lessons, we discussed how to identify and isolate DNA fragments, and then to clone the DNA using a polymerase chain reaction. Today we're going to look at how to insert the gene into a vector, and then once this gene has been inserted in a vector, this is going to be put into host cells in a process called transformation. Then we're going to identify which host cells have taken up the gene, and finally we're going to look at how to grow up those host cells. So once the appropriate fragment of DNA has been cut from the rest of the DNA, the next task is to join it into a carrying unit known as a vector. And this vector is used to transport the DNA into a host cell. So before we look at how this is carried out, let's first consider the importance of the sticky ends left when DNA is cut by restriction endonucleases. So the sequences of DNA that are cut by restriction endonucleases are called recognition sites. So where the recognition site is cut in a staggered fashion, the cut ends of the DNA double strand are left with a single strand that is a few nucleotide bases long. The nucleotides on the single strand at one side of the cut are obviously complementary to the other side because they are previously paired together. So you can see that in this diagram here. So if you use the same restriction endonuclease to cut DNA from different organisms, then all the fragments produced will have ends that are complementary to one another. So this means that the single-stranded end of any one fragment can be joined to the single-stranded end of another. So in other words, their ends are sticky. So can you see why sticky ends are important? If you use the same restriction endonuclease, such as BAMH1, in this diagram here, to cut DNA from different organisms, you can combine the sticky ends together using ligase. Now bacteria contain a piece of circular DNA separate from the cell DNA, and this is called a plasmid. So plasmids are almost always or they almost always contain genes for antibiotic resistance. And it's at one of these antibiotic resistant genes that restriction endonucleases are used to break the plasmid loop. So here you can see a bacterial cell, sorry, a bacterial plasmid that's been extracted from bacterial cells. Now if you cut it using the same restriction enzymes as you've used to cut your DNA fragment, both their sticky ends will be complementary. So when you mix your DNA fragment with the opened up plasmid, your DNA fragment may become incorporated into that plasmid. Do you remember the enzyme that's going to join them together? It's going to be ligase. So an example is the plasmid that has the beta-galactosidase gene. The enzyme beta-galactosidase is used in lactose metabolism. So it's important to insert your gene between the beta-galactosidase gene because the beta-galactosidase gene is going to be used to control and initiate the transcription of the insulin gene. Now remember that insulin is made of two chains. You've got an A chain and a B chain. And these two chains are inserted separately into plasmids. When the fragments of the cDNA are mixed with the cut plasmid, some of the plasmids will match up their sticky ends. And remember that ligase will join the sugar phosphate backbone with phosphodiester bonds. So we say that the plasmid with your gene in it is now called recombinant DNA.
So after your DNA fragment or insulin gene has been incorporated into some of the plasmids, there needs to be reintroduction of this plasmid into bacterial cells, and we call this transformation. So it involves the bacterium and plasmids being mixed in a medium containing calcium ions. Now temperature changes and the calcium ions make the bacterial cell wall permeable. So it will allow some plasmids to pass through into the cytoplasm. However, not all the bacterial cells will possess the DNA fragments, as you can see in this diagram. Only about 1% of bacterial cells will take up the plasmids. And some of the plasmids may have closed without taking up your gene. So you'll have a bacterial cell with no plasmid. And then you can see here a bacterial cell with the plasmid that doesn't contain your gene. So let's have a look at the next step. We need to identify which bacterial cells have taken up the plasmid that contains your gene. So this can be done using gene markers. There are a number of different ways in which this can be achieved. So they all involve using a separate gene on the plasmid that contains the gene that we want. So this second gene is easily identifiable for one reason or another. So let's have a look at them. So you've got different gene markers that can be used to identify which plasmid has taken up the gene. The one that you're going to come across frequently is the antibiotic resistant marker. But I'm going to mention a few others too. So you've got fluorescent genes, then you've got staining, herbicide resistance, and then finally antibiotic resistant markers. Let's have a look at fluorescent genes. The gene for a protein which fluoresces under UV light can be incorporated into the plasmids or linked to the gene being inserted. This gene produces a green fluorescent protein. And this green fluorescent protein gene is from a jellyfish. Now, if you want to tag your protein so you can identify it in an organism, for example, you can see in the mice here, you attach the DNA of the GFP, the DNA of the green fluorescent protein, to your protein. And when these genes are translated, your protein will fluoresce. Now, if you want to identify or use it to identify which bacteria have taken up the recombinant DNA, you can insert the gene you're trying to clone into the center of this GFP gene. So any bacterium that has taken up the plasmid with the gene you want to clone will not be able to produce GFP, this green fluorescent protein. So it's not going to fluoresce green. So if you look at the bacterial cells under a microscope, you can identify which bacterial cells don't fluoresce. And those are the cells that have taken up your recombinant DNA. Now another option is to tag your gene with the green fluorescent protein. So this means that when your protein is translated, the green fluorescent protein will also be translated too. So how will you identify your bacterial cells with the recombinant DNA? It's going to be opposite to what I've just mentioned. The cells that fluoresce will have the recombinant DNA in them. Another technique is to identify your bacterial cells uh, while well, you use a gene that codes for a protein that can be stained. For example, beta-glucuronidase <laughs> breaks down a substrate that will produce a blue color. This means that when your bacterial cells have got this recombinant DNA, they're going to produce a blue color. So if you look at the agar plate on the right there, those that have got a blue color will have your recombinant DNA. Now what happens if you've got a gene for lactase, which is similar to the one that I've just mentioned, if you insert your gene into the gene for lactase, 
Will a blue color be produced? Well, if you insert your gene into the middle of this gene that produces the colored substrate, then the colonies grown from this will not produce lactase. So when these colonies are grown on agar medium with the colorless substrate, they won't be able to change the substrate's color. So where the gene has not transformed the bacteria, the colonies will turn the substrate blue. So it's opposite to what I've just said. Okay, herbicide resistance. If you'd like your plants to be resistant to herbicides, you can spray the plants with a herbicide. Those plants that survive, you can extract the DNA that makes them resistant, and then you insert this DNA into other plants. Now, bacteria over the years have evolved resistance to the effects of antibiotics. They produce an enzyme that breaks down the antibiotic before it can destroy the bacterium. And the genes for the production of these enzymes are found in the plasmids. Now some plasmids carry genes for resistance for more than one antibiotic, as you can see in this plasmid. So this plasmid's got resistance for antibiotic A and anti antibiotic B. Now genes for antibiotic resistance were popular as markers at first. But there were concerns that plasmids with antibiotic resistance could come into contact with pathogenic bacteria and the plasmid could be transferred. So this would introduce antibiotic markers into pathogens. So this is the reason that the alternative markers are becoming more popular these days. So here we have a plasmid that has resistance to antibiotic A and antibiotic B. Once you've inserted your gene between the gene for resistance to antibiotic B, as you can see in that pink there, you transform the plasmids into the bacterial cells. Now we need to identify which bacterial cells have taken up the recombinant plasmid. How do we do this? Well, you first grow your bacterial cells onto a nutrient agar plate that has got antibiotic A in it. So you're going to allow the colonies to develop. The colonies that grow on this plate are therefore resistant to antibiotic A. So the bacterial cells have taken up the plasmid. You then use the sponge technique to transfer these colonies onto another agar plate that has got antibiotic B in it. Which bacterial cells are going to grow on this plate? Will your bacterial cells that have taken up your gene in the plasmid be able to grow on this plate? Think about it. Well, when you inserted your gene, you inserted it into the middle of the gene for resistance to antibiotic B. This means that your recombinant plasmid will not be resistant to antibiotic B because they cannot make the proteins for um, resistance to B because the gene has been cut. So the colonies will therefore die when grown on antibiotic B agar plate. Now have a look at this diagram. Which colonies on agar plate A are not present in agar plate B. Yes, those two colonies there. These are the colonies that have taken up your recombinant DNA. So these colonies can then be extracted from the dish of antibiotic A, that green plate there, and then cloned to make genetically identical offspring. Now here you can see Kyle identifying the antibiotic resistant colonies of the bacteria that have been grown on the agar plate. He then selects for these colonies and adds them to a broth so that they can be cloned and grown up. Now once we've identified these bacterial cells that have got the recombinant DNA, we grow them up 
so they can start producing our protein. And there's two ways to grow up the bacteria, either by batch culture or continuous culture. We're going to look at these in more detail under the topic biotechnology. So here you can see batch culturing, which involves loading the fermenter with all the necessary materials, allowing the bacteria to grow and produce their products. Nutrients are not added, nor are the products removed during the process. So the process is stopped after a specific stage and the product is removed. The ferment is then cleaned out. If you have a look at continuous culture, there's a constant stream of nutrients being added and the products are continuously being removed over a period of many weeks. Right, let's have a look at what we've discussed in this topic. We looked at inserting a gene into a vector, which can be a bacterial plasmid, then inserting this plasmid into a bacterium, and then cloning that bacteria. And in the next topic, we're going to look at how the bacteria produce a protein. And that concludes our lesson, the end.